Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, we have Reverend Peter Panagor, who holds a bachelor's degree in English from University of Massachusetts and a Master of Divinity from Yale University. He is a storyteller, writer, producer, and an on-air talent who broadcasts on two television stations in Maine as Minister of First Radio Parish Church of America, reaching 50,000 viewers daily. The Reverend also produces a statewide Sunday morning radio show, and you can visit dailydevotions.org to find out more about that. His stories have appeared in Stories from a Soldier's Heart and chicken soup for the veteran soul he's the author of two books two minutes for god and heaven is beautiful how dying taught me that death is just the beginning reverend panagore has spoken across the united states on the stages of ians which is the international association of near-death studies and at hospice conferences. You can visit his website, peterpanagore.com, and like I said earlier, dailydevotions.org, or simply go to wedontdieradio.com and click on episode 127 to see the magnificent man we are talking to today. Reverend Peter, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hello, Sandra, and you can just call me Peter, please. Peter, please. All right. Well, you can leave the please off. I know, but you know... (laughs) You know from our first few minutes that I am a playful gal. Uh Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me on your show. This is an honor. I appreciate it very much. And hello, listeners. Hello. (laughs) Yeah. Um, We've got quite a group of wonderful people that are listening right now. And just before I uh, dialed you, I watched your interview on Fox and Friends. That's my mom's favorite TV show. And I just thought, hey, look at you. So you've really made uh, made an impact with your words and your story and your book it's my one goal wow wow well how about a little bit of your backstory before all this happened you um had told me you grew up in massachusetts is that correct Mm -hmm. in my neck of the woods in in eastern massachusetts Mm -hmm. Uh, oh go ahead no go ahead i'm i'm here i uh went to st john's high school and shrewsbury mass catholic school was raised Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic from a split family, went to both churches, Uh, spent my high school years having lots of fun, and in my late high school years had a conversion experience, was slain in the spirit in my first year of college, and became a charismatic Catholic. I don't know. For a couple of years. Charismatic Catholic is kind of like uh, Pentecostal in the Catholic Church. Okay. But all of that kind of went away uh, in March of 1980. Okay. And were you working at the time? I was a student. I worked construction during the summers okay. and on weekends, but I was a, a college student. Okay. And then what happened? Well, I left my family on purpose. I went west to Montana State University to go ski primarily, primarily at Bridger Bowl, but also to study Native American studies, which didn't work out so well for me. I couldn't get into the class, and I ended up joining a theater company instead, wow. which took me on this grand national tour that ha- that occurred right after my near-death experience, and it played into what happened to me on the mountain pretty significantly. I went ice climbing in Alberta, Canada, and backcountry snow caving in British Columbia, right on the borderline there in March of 1980 with a partner named Tim. And on our ice climb, I made a miscalculation in my equipment that slowed our ascent down significantly to the point that we arrived at the very top of our climb at sunset when we were supposed to be at the bottom of our climb at sunset. And our position put us in a place of immediate hypothermia, and we decided that we were going to try to survive the night because I was pretty sure we were going to die, and so was Tim. I'd been, I'd been on the National Ski Patrol since I was a sophomore in high school mm-hmm. and had been working at Bridger Bowl in Bozeman, which is a great ski mountain, and 
as a ski patrol and had spent the winter in the coldest times that I'd ever been skiing. There was a month of 50 below. And wow. so I was, yeah, it was really, really cold. And despite what they say about when it's that cold, it's dry, you don't feel it. Well, that's only partly true mm. as it turns out. But we went on this ice climb and I made a mistake and the night became the longest night of my life. Uh, also, it became the night where I discovered a great amount of willpower inside myself. Yeah, I actually watched a video. You have an hour and a half YouTube video um, from a speech that you gave. And uh, for anyone listening here, when you go to We Don't Die Radio episode 127, I have a link to that because it is such, we don't have time for the whole story now, but it is such an engaging story. And I mean, I was really on the edge of my seat and listening to your climb and what happened. And man, my heart really went out for you. How scary. Yep. I still, I, I, I haven't been diagnosed with PTSD from that, but I, I can't tell the story without crying. Oh, it's I just. Don't blame you. Racking to me. Cold and scary and uncertain of your future. So why don't mm-hmm. you, in your words, um, you know, share. We, you, were you a seasoned climber at that time? I was a seasoned outdoors person. Okay. I'd been a backpacker and a mountaineer and I'd spent my childhood from the age of, well, I guess I was 11 when I joined Boy Scouts, but I I was a Boy Scout till Mm -hmm. I was, geez, 18. But I spent about one weekend a month in outdoors backpacking and camping since I was 11. And that included November, December, January, February, and March. So I'd spent, I I wasn't unaccompanied, uh, pardon me, unaccustomed to being outside in the cold weather and survival skills. I, I prided myself on my survival skills. I, right. and I lived in a snow cave the entire week before we went on this ice climb, backcountry skiing way up into a Cinnaboyne Provincial Park. Uh, it had a fantastic trip. Uh, dangerous, but my partner Tim was also an experienced wilderness uh, person, and we complemented each other's skill sets. Of course, of course. So, Here's the time. Let us in on what happened and where you were and, and how this near-death experience happened. Well, I was at Montana State University as an undergraduate exchange student in the National Student Exchange Program, and I didn't want to go back to Boston in March of 1980. I wanted to go and have an adventure because I had two weeks off. And so I went and found a partner to go do something fun and incredible. And he had a trip planned to British Columbia and Alberta to go backcountry skiing, as I mentioned, and snow caving and ice climbing. And Tim was a, a lead climber, certified lead climber on rock and ice. And I'd done a fair amount of rock climbing and high altitude adventure, but I'd never gone ice climbing before. And so I was super intrigued and very gung ho. So at the end of our trip, after being out there in the wilderness for eight days in the snow caves, we went to this place called Lower Weeping Wall, which is on uh, kind of north, northwest of Banff and south of Jasper, wow. west of Calgary, high up in the Canadian Way Mountains. up, yeah. Yep. And we went to this climb. It was a world-famous climb. Tim, and, Tim knew about it. And we arrived at the climb pretty early in the morning. And... Uh, I won't tell the entire all the details because they're, they're, they're in the book and we don't have a lot of time. But we went to the climb and began our ascent. And I made a mistake in my gathering up of gear. And I only had one ice axe and, a, and an ice hammer. And a hammer is significantly shorter than an axe, which means the distribution of weight on it prevents... Uh, letting go and dangling on the hammer. So uh, with an ax, you can plant the ax into the ice and actually let go of the handle and dangle on a strap that's set about a third of the way up the handle mm-hmm. with a, with a, on your wrist and relax and rest. But the hammer is so short that the strap was in the bottom of the hammer. And when you plant the hammer into the ice, if you try to dangle on the strap, the hammer pulls out. So you have to grip it the whole time, which mm-hmm. burned out my arms sure. because... I'm only so strong. And so we got to the top of the climb at sunset and recognized the desperation of our situation immediately. Uh, We began with 
violent, racking shivers, a clattering jaw, and we discussed spending the night right where we were. The temperature dropped, I don't know, 30 degrees uh, since the sun went down. And we talked about snuggling up against the mountain with each other, canoodling in order to conserve our strength mm -hmm. and our heat. But we were out of food, out of water, wet to the skin because I, ice climbing is a wet sport. And I was wearing wool mostly because it was 1980. Uh, and we were soaked. So we were in serious situation, serious trouble. We decided that if we stayed on the mountain, we were definitely going to die. And we would fight our way off and die trying. And that's what we did. The night was dark. The rope became a very long 300-foot tangled knot. It took us a couple hours to untangle it when we first got up to the top. We made our first descent down a um, rappel, I should say, down an incline and reverse incline slope so that part of our repelling was in free space, landing on an area, maybe, I don't know, I'm going to guess 16 by 16, mm -hmm. uh, deep snow. By that point, we had begun to lose our cognitive abilities. We were, our jaws were freezing, our lips were freezing, frostbite had set in on our toes and fingers and noses and ears. And we were stumbling about because our coordination was lacking. The rope got stuck up above us. We couldn't get it free. Wow. Tim decided that uh, as the responsible lead climber, uh, that he would reascend up the rope using ascending knots on some other line that we had brought with us, a very dangerous decision, but it was the only choice that we had because we were definitely going to die if we didn't get out of this and the only way to go get the rope was to go back up the rope. And so Tim began an ascent back up the rope as I held it as steadily as I could. His a weight and jerking motion on the rope finally broke it free from the frozen position that it was in. And he fell maybe 15 or 20 feet down into the deep snow that I was lying in, kind of landed half on me and half off me. But we got the rope free. We had already tried to yank it free, but we couldn't get it done with all of our weight. So Tim was, had a, as I had said, it was going back up to release it. But the rope came free, and we uh, traversed over to our next rappel, went down that rappel, and that was kind of in the, in the dark. The, the moon had risen up and created a situation where we could see, almost see color. We went down this crag in the rock around some outcroppings and things that we couldn't really see because it was in the shadows. We got to the final rappel position, which was on rock face out of the ice with a, a standing area of a ledge, maybe 12 to 16 inches with your nose up against the rock face and an iron pin and an iron ring pounded into the rock where you clipped your harness into. Tim was to my left. I was to the right and I tied off the rope to my harness and dropped to the other end to pull it down through the ring at the top of the previous rappel. But the rope got jammed around the corner in the dark up the mountain, and it stayed jammed for hours. By this time, it was probably three in the morning, mm, wow. and we had arrived probably at, I don't even know what time the sun set the night before, but it, you know, it was March, and it was high altitude. So it was pretty dark, pretty early, and very cold. The rope was stuck. Tim and I had earlier decided that we wouldn't speak to each other unless it was absolutely necessary because every time we talked, we felt our energy levels decline. Our bodies began to feel like they were consuming themselves because we had no fat on us and we were expending huge amounts of energy just to stay alive. I came to the conclusion that I wasn't going to get out of it. I had gotten warm and unzipped my coat, which I knew better than to do. But, you know, when your brain's not working right, you do stuff that's crazy. Right. And a peace sort of settled over me as I recognized that I was not going to get out of this. And it was really, really beautiful. I, I didn't mention the incredibly stunning beauty that we were seeing all around us all the time, a bazillion stars overhead of every color you could imagine. The Columbia ice fields off in the distance, we could see glittering in the moonlight. And I said a prayer to God. 
thank you for my life and this was a beautiful place to die and I was thinking about my family and I began to fall asleep mm -hmm. and I'd fall asleep and fall off my little ledge and smack into the mountain because I had a harness on and there's some play in the harness so I wouldn't fall very far but I would fall and smack in and that would wake me up and I pulled myself back up and yank on the rope and continue to try to drive uh, our success and our future life by willpower. Tim was in a very similar condition that I was in. I pulled myself back up and I saw something I'd never seen before as I stood there. I, I saw this black circle in all of my peripheral vision, like a old movie ending where it fades to black and my peripheral vision in a, in a circle began to close on me very rapidly and I looked around and I everywhere I looked I saw this circle of darkness closing in on my vision till my vision became narrower and narrower and narrower and then it just went out into blackness and I felt myself fall and I thought to myself as I fell I'm not asleep I'm still awake I still have consciousness and I didn't feel myself hit the mountain and the next thing I knew in my confusion about what was going on was there was this rushing toward me in completely consuming all of my vision. Although I knew my eyes were shut, I saw this, I don't know how to describe it. Everything I described from this point out is not accurate because there was no things, there were no things and no time. It, anyway, this thing came rushing toward me, filling my entire vision, sort of a, sort of a misty, cloudy, ocean, water, breath, and it communicated to me directly inside of my mind without language, I'm taking you. And, and, it, and it did so in a demanding, absolutist way. And I took all of my willpower that I had remaining and tried to block it from taking me, but it just plucked me like I was a a piece of grass and and took me wow. and the next thing I knew I was in this greater darkness that was illuminated and it was infinite and I could see in every single direction at once and I had a consciousness but I I could see myself and I had no body I was a an, a, a being that had no form uh, no thing but a solid consciousness, like a sphere of consciousness. And like I said, I could see in 10,000 directions all at once, and I could think incredibly clearly. For the first time in my life, I, I, I could think more clearly than I'd ever thought before. And, and there was no time. It was timelessness and uh, no thing present. And a gigantic door opened in front of me. And... and it was right up against me and I touched it with my being and the door, the doorway was translucent and transparent and I could see down into it like a, an infinitely arcing darkness tunnel. And I was at this threshold of it and I touched it with my being and it turned out that this translucent, transparent flow that was this door was living, alive. And as I touched it, I was infilled with this living and life and at the same time I heard my name called from deep 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 inside myself and I suddenly knew that I was in the presence of God who was near me next to me surrounding me but I couldn't see God I could still see everything else but this voice that had no sound that spoke no language said my name which wasn't Peter it was the essence of my being from this great distance of my origin and I instantly knew that I was a created being by the creator, by the voice, who then infilled me with a, this combination of, of joy, truth, love, beauty, hope, compassion, kindness, um, all one thing, truth, all wound into oneness. And I was infilled with this to overflowing. And I knew in that instant that I was completely known and that I'd always been known and beloved. And in that instant of knowing that I was known, 
all of the pain that I'd ever caused everyone in my entire life from the moment of my birth uh, became evident to me in a, a visual memory sequence of everything I'd ever done to hurt anyone intentionally and unintentionally. And I suffered all of the pain that I'd ever caused everyone in my life magnified by 10,000 times. Wow. That's the life Just, review we hear about, right? It, it, it was, but it, it was only about suffering and the suffering that I had caused. Interesting. And, and I, was ashamed, not not just because I had caused so much suffering uh, in my life, but because I saw the suffering in comparison with the absolute divine love that is infinite. And I saw myself as as creature created, who, cre who had the power to create suffering and love. But that didn't come until a, a minute or so later in this timeless place where there was no minutes. We're no minutes. And, and meanwhile, as I went through this review, the voice that had no sound kept saying inside me, I love you. I made you. I've always known you. There's nothing about you I have not known. I've always known everything about you. I love you. I forgive you. I love you. I forgive you. And, and, and I was forgiven and my shame vanished and I was infilled once again with this combination of love and beauty and truth and hope and joy and it was such that I was so much more than my own self and all the love that I had given and gathered in my life all of that was the treasure of my soul and I could see that love was the was the was the commodity it was the value it was the 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 most important thing that I'd ever done with my life was allowed myself to be loved and loved other people. And the voice who was absolutely present to me, next to me, but I could not see, said to me, and no, the voice wasn't male or female either. It had no sound and it had no language. I had no culture. I had no, no words, but it said directly to my being, my soul, I love you. I made you. You are my beloved. And I said inside myself, am I dead? And the voice said, yes, you're dead. And I said, but I can't die now. And the voice said, why? I said, well, my parents are suffering. My sister had vanished when I was 14, um, caused a great deal of suffering in my family life, my mom in particular. Yes. And it's the reason I left Boston for Montana. I couldn't take it anymore. And God took me and showed me all of Earth, all of Earth, all at once. And I could see every individuated human being on the entire planet. And I could see that they were suffering. I could see that they were beloved. And I could see that they had a shroud that prevented them from seeing what I could see, which was the absolute infinite love and beauty of God that was infilling me and was so much greater than me, in infinitely greater than me. And the voice said, in the way that I love you now, I have always loved you. And because of my love, you now know that all has always been well, all is well and all will be well because of my love. And I knew that to be the ultimate truth. And God showed me the faces of my parents in particular, and I could see their suffering. And God said, because of my love, all will be well for them. You don't have to go back. But I could see their suffering. And I said, but they're going to lose another child. And it's going to cause them a great deal of suffering. And knowing what I know about the suffering that I caused, I can't let them go through that. Right. And God said, nothing. And I said, here's, an, here's another reason why I can't go. I'm in this theater company. We're going on this big national tour. And I made a promise to the director that I would not be injured because there, was, there were no understudies. It was 64 shows, 24,000 miles, all over 14 Western states, over three months performing um, to audiences of 2,000 down to audiences of 30. And I had a, I had a commitment that I had made. And I said, I said, 
I haven't gone through the door yet. And God said, no, you, you haven't. And I said, well, if I go back to earth, can I come back here to this beauty and love and truth and forgiveness and knowing of my, the essence of my being is a, as a created orb of, a orb of beauty uh, whose, whose physical life was the wink of an eye. And, <clears throat> and I knew myself to be everlasting. And God said, yes, you can come back here. And I said, well, then I choose to live my life. And God said, you won't live your life. That's the last thing I heard as I was being screwed back into my body again, painfully. I came to on my harness dangling with a complete confusion about where I was or what I was or what was going on and, and a great amount of pain. Mm -hmm. And I heard this screaming noise that I couldn't identify because I didn't understand my ears or hearing or voices or language or culture or, or anything. And eventually I came to the surface and began to understand that, that I was being yelled at and, and yanked on. And I got pulled back up and it was my partner, Tim, not yelling at me with anger, but with fear, saying, you are dead. If you died, I was going to die. I would die if you die." And I thought you were dead. And I swam into this world again with a great deal of confusion. And, and Tim talked to me for a while, and I don't really remember what he said, but I remember him telling me to pull on the rope and indicating the rope, and he couldn't really reach the rope, and the details about that are in the book. And I pulled on the rope, and the first pull, after hours of being stuck where we were, on the first pull, um, the rope came free, and we descended, wow. and we self-treated for hypothermia until the sun came up inside of our tent, and uh, the parking lot was right across the street from the climb. We got in the car at sunup and turned the heater on because we finally realized that we'd be better off. We weren't really getting warm in the tent, uh, and so we'd be better off inside the car with the heater, and, and that's what we did. And uh, we left. I never told Tim. The next night, we had a terrible car wreck, and uh, the, the trip went downhill from there. Things were terrible, worse than they were, and I ended up having to hitchhike back to the United States by myself oh my across, the, across the Canadian border and um, ended up with a stutter from the wreck. And... Um, on that morning, the morning after, I was so confused about where I was. I didn't understand what the world was anymore. Everything seemed two-dimensional to me and black and white and rather ugly. I was in a very beautiful place. Canada, Western Canada is stunningly beautiful. And it was, it was ugly to me. It was anything compared to the greatest beauty of the world was a thousand, ten thousand, a million times less than. And I, re I remember that night, the, the night before the car wreck, as we, as we drove back to southern Canada, we stopped and, and got a pizza. And I remember uh, not understanding or being sort of uncomfortable and grossed out by having to eat, having to consume these things and, with, and machination with my teeth, my teeth, and having to swallow energy and, and put it into my biology and, and have to uh, have hands. And uh, uh, it was crude and rough. And, and so I, I kept a secret and I went on this theater tour. I, I should mention it was a sign language, American Sign Language Theater tour. Oh. So I didn't have to use my voice and I didn't for three months. I signed. Um, because I had a stutter and went on this tour and spent my time in the back of the pickup truck alone by myself with my camping gear to keep warm. It was a 15 passenger van, a pickup and a trailer to haul all our gear around the United States. And I spent most of my time meditating and, and being quiet and trying to figure out what had happened to me. And, and that's a summation of what's in the book. Wow. And I've heard from people too, that, when they've had near-death experiences, you don't have that body in it. And so it occurs as painful to come back in. And that makes sense yes. about e eating the pizza and, and dealing with your body. And plus, you went through a major physical shock. 
major. Plus, I was still recovering from hypothermia and, and frostbite. I mean, I, I still I still have I had second degree. It wasn't third degree frostbite, but I, I still have the temperature hits 50 degrees and I have to wear gloves and a hat and, and I have electric heaters in my ski boots. And wow. um, I it's and I live north. I live in the northland. It's crazy that I live up this far because uh, it's cold so often. But the, the residuals of it continue to this day. They never go away. Um, hmm. well, let me just ask you before we go on. Do you remember your near-death experience like it was just yesterday? Or how does it compare to it never goes away. other memories? It, other memories fade. I, I, I've often pondered, okay, so I was dead. How do I remember what happened when I had no brain? I had no physical brain. How do I remember this? I, I don't know. Some sort of quantum connection between the memory of my soul and my body uh, somehow helps me understand and remember what happened to me. And the way I remember it is different than the way I talk about it. I talk about it as if it happened in a sequence of events, Mm -hmm. as if I had a physical body, uh, not a flesh body, but some sort of physicality. But that was not my experience whatsoever. There was no language and there were no things. Nothing there was a thing. I was created. I was a creature, but I wasn't a thing like we can conceive of here. Um, And how do I remember when I didn't have a brain? I don't understand how that works. But but (laughs) That's a big question. (laughs) It's a big question, but I remember it completely. Right. It keeps revealing itself, too. See, that's the other part of it, too. As I think about it. I understand it differently as I age, as I ponder it, as I as I study and read and listen and pursue this thing, which is what I my whole life changed as a result of this. I I was a I spent my undergraduate years working in construction. I'd spent my childhood hanging out of my dad's architectural office pushing a pencil. The family goal uh, was for me to go to a an architectural graduate school and get a degree in architecture and, and take over the family business. And all of that went away. I, um, and my, and my dad's business eventually collapsed and closed because I wasn't there. And, um, and he changed careers as a result. And I went to divinity school to study mysticism. Mm-hmm. I've been in a so I, I've been going to this Trappist monastery. You know, you you see the little jellies and jams at at Shop and Save or uh, Shop and Stop or Hannaford, wherever you guys call it, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. That monastery was associated. My high school was right near there. My prep school was right near there, Catholic school, wow. and my religion teacher would go on retreat at the monastery. And he came back in my senior year, seventy seven, taught us meditation, and 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 so. When I got back to UMass, my last semester, I took a class called Mysticism East and West, and the professor was associated with the monastery, and so he took us on a sashin, a Zen retreat, at the monastery, and we met Theophane Boyd, the guest master and novitiate master, who, who I could I could see I could see his soul. He, his eyes were like laser beams. I, I knew that he could see me wow. as my soul. And so I started going to the monastery on retreat in order to figure out what had happened to me. And I decided that I was going to be a Trappist monk. But before I did that, uh, because I happened to like sex, I decided that I would think about it and get a graduate <laughs> degree. And because, you know, celibacy is a big deal. Yeah, you know, sure I, I'm is. in this body, but you got to eat. You got to drink in yeah. this body. And sex is part of that. Um, and so part of that um, physical nature. And so I, I pursued a graduate degree. Um, we ended up going to Yale. The, the dean of admissions, I, I talked her into letting me study what I wanted to study which was mysticism, which where there is no degree in that. Right. So I, I created classes. She helped me find a professor. She helped me take classes across the university so that I could spend my time reading about people who could be like me. And I, I, I still kept a secret about this. It wasn't until my third year of div school, uh, master's is three years, um, that I came across the book, uh, Life After Life by Raymond Raymond Moody. 
Exactly. And I read the book and I realized, oh, my God, this could be me. And so uh, Kenneth Ring had done the foreword or some part of the book and he was a professor right up the road in Connecticut. And so I called, I looked him up, I found him, I called him at his office and I said, you know, professor, I need, you know, I'm so-and-so and I'm at the new school here down at Yale and I think this happened to me. Can I tell you my story? Can you tell me if I might be one of them? Mm-hmm. And I did it. He said, yes. Wow. I still kept it a secret. I told my wife on the night before we got married, but it's kooky. It's crazy. So I didn't tell anyone till now about 15 or 16 years ago. Yeah. Wait, Um, there's so many of us in different areas of this, and that's such a big fear. People are going to think we're nuts. Yeah, well, I'm I'm basically a rational empiricist. Mm -hmm. At my high school, they called me the scientist. But because I was always trying to, and I wasn't really great in science, it was not my subject, but right. I love the idea of it. Yeah. And uh, so I, I kept it a secret because it's kooky. I have no proof. I can't prove this happened to me. The only, the only evidence I have is the result of my life, the direction change I took, the things that I did. I became a, an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, um, and I worked with the dying and the grieving wow. and the suffering yeah, because they were my people. Thank you for that. That's extraordinary. Yeah, there's quite a number. I've discovered quite a number of NDEers who end up working in hospice. Yes. It's a natural fit. We're not afraid of death. Right. We recognize that the other side has healing and love that's beyond imagination, and we can be helpers, as Fred Rogers would call us. We're we're helpers. Mm-hmm. And just because time's going by fast, I I'm guessing you know the day came that you really saw that your story could make a difference. What well, worked? yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. I'm no, sorry. Go ahead. I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to ask. So well, I, 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 there was this huge embezzlement in the church that I was serving. I, I live in, on the coast of Maine in a mm-hmm. resort town. And when I got called, as we say in the UCC, the United Church of Christ, I got called to serve this pulpit in this church. It was a sick church. There was something terrible going on, but I couldn't figure it out. Mm-hmm. I resigned twice in the first 16 weeks. Um, but I was convinced to stay because uh, a professor from Northeastern, who was the de- the the deacon, the head deacon. He had been the chair in Boston at, at uh, Northeastern. I trusted him, and he's a science guy. Talked me into staying because he knew that there was some terrible darkness. And there was twenty thousand dollars missing every year, and eventually, uh, through a long period of time of gr- of great suffering for the congregation, of being of me being attacked, uh, the people who were colluding with the thief tried to defrock me and ruin my career and have me thrown out because I was a uh, near death experience leaves me without any real context for culture or, mm-hmm. uh, and rather fearless. And I knew that there was a problem and um, I'm sort of dogged. And so anyway, eventually we found, we found the thief, we prosecuted. And at the end of all of this, you know, it took cheapers nine years of digging to find the truth. At the end of all of it, one Sunday morning, somebody came up to me and said, Peter, I'm climbing into the pulpit. We've been talking among ourselves and we realized you must have a great amount of faith to have endured what we put you through. Mm. And I had my sermon in my hand and I realized, oh my God, I can't continue to lie to these people. I've been lying From the moment I climbed into the pulpit, everybody thinks I'm a believer. They all think I have faith. I don't have any faith. I don't have any belief. It all went away the day that I died. And God became real to me, more real than this world, the only real that there is. I'm not a believer. I, I I know that God knows me. I know where I'm from. I know where I'm going. This world is like living in an illusion for me, an illusion that's physical and, and wonderful and beautiful and, and suffering and 
Um, but it's, it's not where I'm from and it's not where I'm going. And, and I already know that. So on the, that day, on that Sunday morning, for the first time ever publicly without planning, I told them my story, which is not to say that I hadn't been being forced inside myself to speak this for all of those years. And I stitched my lips shut. Right. I was a rebellious person against God because God, I felt like God cursed me into living in this world where, where I'm an alien now. But it turns out it wasn't a curse so much as a blessing and that I made the choice to come back. And God just warned me, you won't live your life. I always figured it was a curse, but no, it was a warning. Things were going to be different for you now. And, and they are and they were. And so I came out to my congregation that day. And within a week, six people in my town had come up to me and said or contacted me and said, I'm one too. Wow. All medical, they were all brought back medically. Somebody threw an injection, mm -hmm. most of them through the paddles. Uh, and they never talk about it. There's this shame about it or this, this everybody, we're, we're afraid that people are going to think we're crazy. And, and some people have said that about me now. You know, I kept that, that was the, my biggest trouble. I wanted to be seen as being uh, a reasonable person, a, a successful person, a professional person. And, and after that day, that Sunday, everything began to shift. Wow. Yeah. Human beings, we have a need to be liked. And, and I don't know if that's our ego or what, but there's such a fear as to what other people will think. And I've probably like you, I've talked to enough people and we all have a similar story of having this fear. But once we share who we are, do you, I mean, it's my experience. I don't know if it's yours that more people embrace it and want to know than the people who think we're weird. There's just a lot of people hiding out with, with, yes. you know, wondering. And, and, um, uh, even with the show, I mean, thousands are listening and it's like people want to know. So we're hiding out, we're listening, we're doing our research. And meanwhile, the person next to you or that you work with that you think, Oh, I can't possibly share this with, they've got that same inner knowing and the, or that same desire, yet that same fear. Yes, exactly. So, and, I wrote the book for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to encourage near death experiencers to speak to people that they love about it. You don't have to, you don't have to get a big bully pulpit and, and be on the radio. You just need to talk to the people around you, the people that you trust, the people that you love. They, they will, they need to know. They need to know and, and that you're not crazy. That's the first thing, but they're afraid of dying and you're not. And people's biggest fear is death. Sure. Sure. Um, tell us, just looking at the clock now, what it is you're up to now. I know you interview a lot. You speak on many stages. But a, a little bit maybe about your um, daily television broadcast, your daily devotions, because, and even how we can get in touch with you and purchase your book. Sure. I, I have two websites. One is peterpanagor.com. Uh, and you should be able to reach it by peterpanagor.love too. Hmm. And it's a, it's my professional, my book, my author's website where you can find links to the book. It's uh, for sale in England and published in Canada and the United States. It's, it's everywhere. In, yeah, it's everywhere. It's, <laughs> I have lots of people in Australia contacting me. It's, and the other website is dailydevotions.org. It's the church that I serve. It's a broadcast organization started in 1926 on AM radio. These days we produce primarily video productions for television and for the web. And I only have one, I only have one thing to say and that God is love and that you are beloved. And uh, we've produced 1,612 videos, 360 radio shows. Uh, for Sundays, and wow. uh, I'm a brief storyteller. Every one of them is two minutes or, or less, and I am a, a, an inspirational broadcaster on two NBC stations here in Maine on Sunday mornings. 
Um, and that's what I do. I produce videos, write stories about love and beauty and human suffering and all in between. And I, I'm working on another book, and I'm a granddad. And um, congratulations! Yep. Thank you. It's great. She's a fabulous thing mm-hmm. um, in my life. She's wonderful. And so I work is what I do. I work for God. God's my boss. I am driven by this one thing, and I pursue it. I meditate. I'm a yogi been doing that for both of those things for well well over 30 years and it, i think that if people want to know god if you want to find god if you read the global literature that goes back centuries the books that get handed down century after century in the east and in the west they all describe meditation and contemplation as the access point to god you know, the, there's zen in the art of archery there's uh, the Upanishads, there's the Bible, um, there's the cloud of unknowing and the writings of Teresa of Avila and Julian of Norwich. It's all about prayer. If you want to pursue God, learn to pray and figure out how to do that. And that's your access point. It opens up the eye inside yourself. It opens up the door inside yourself. And the continual practice of it is what keeps the door open and keeps the eye open. Oh, it's a really great way of putting it. I'm not a daily meditator, and I say I would like to be, but I have not put in the practice. But Peter, I have had such profound experiences, so I know that there's something available, and I love how you say the doorway, you know, and it's, I don't know if you want to call it a muscle to build, but to get into the practice of that, there is something available, because it's experiences like no other um before we end this could you talk a little bit about suffering um it sounds like when you kind of came back from your near-death experience and trying to find yourself and everything like there's suffering that's involved and a lot of us have things that we are suffering with and from a your point of view um Gosh, it's a big question to say a meaning to suffering or how we can deal with suffering. Do you have any any words that might give us a little bit of peace if we're suffering now? Everybody suffers. Everybody suffers all the time. Wow. Whether it's the sliver in your in your heel because you you know didn't put your shoes on, you walked on the board, or or whether it's emotional suffering or psychological suffering, or and it seems to be built into the entire structure of the universe. It's not just humans who suffer. It's animals and planets and star systems. The whole thing is constructed with this dichotomy of of uh, the absolute omniscient presence of God inside of all things and the suffering we endure on a daily basis. It's this, this paradox of these two things. Suffering ends on the day that you die and love doesn't. Love continues. Love is real. Love is lasting. Love is the treasure. Love is the value. Love is the the thing that when you give it away, it comes back to you and overflows inside of yourself. And you don't even know that it happens. I didn't. I couldn't see that. Loving each other. it's It's the treasure. Jesus came and talked about that. And so did lots of others. Right. So to ease suffering, turn on the love? Would that turn happen? on the love. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. but it's, It doesn't eliminate it, okay? No. It, doesn't, it doesn't stop it, but it does ease it, and that's the right word. That's the right word. And, and in the end, when you cross over, you'll find yourself in the presence of God, and, and all of the chaff that surrounds your life, the suffering, will be burned off and eliminated, and you won't need it anymore, and you won't carry it with you. And there's only utter mercy and forgiveness and love and beauty beyond imagination. I'm incapable of saying what it is. There are no words. Yeah, it's interesting. You and many other of the guests that I've interviewed that have had near-death experiences, one, it's so vivid, you remember it like it was just not even yesterday, two seconds ago. 
like it's right now more than any other memory ever and then there's this feeling that there's no words that we have in language to describe it and the third thing i didn't even think of but everybody wants to give back and make a difference and turns their life over to serving others Mm -hmm. and that could be a big ways you know you can you can serve people by working in hospice but it can be in little tiny ways, just being uh, in your daily life. It doesn't have to be some sort of dedication of every day that you become a nun or a brother or, a or book something. Or whatever. Right. Yeah. Just loving the people around you. That's really the key. Just learn to love. And, and that doesn't mean you have to like everybody uh, and that you might not have enemies. But that doesn't mean that you can't love your enemies. Peter, did your sister ever come back around? Yes and no. Um, she was gone till about six years ago um, when she died, and we had just begun reestablishing relationship with her. She'd popped in and out over those decades, but we were working on eliminating the estrangement when she had a heart attack and died. Wow. Gotcha. Yep. And now she's surrounded by that love. She is. And, and she came to my mom. A lot of people have an experience after someone they love dies. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't talk about these. We don't talk about these things, but they happen all the time. My mom in her dream, uh, sort of a vivid dream, her mom and dad and my sister, Andrea, all three came back and Andrea stepped forward in the dream and said to my mother, mom, I'm, I'm so sorry for the suffering that I caused you. I didn't know. I didn't understand. I apologize and I ask for your forgiveness. And my mom forgave her. And my mom could see that it, that Andrea was surrounded by love and living in love. And it rested my mom's heart at ease. Oh, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. And if you were to ask your mom, and you might have... You know, some of those dreams, I hear these stories, they, they're more real than any other dreams. They're more real than any other dreams because they it's, are real. They are real. Oh, Peter, do you have any closing thoughts or is there a question I should have asked you that I didn't ask you or um, any, you know, I, I like to leave myself, yourself and listeners with um, just maybe something positive we can do in our day today. Just, is there any last minute? Words. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Okay. One, near-death experience people are aliens here. We're, we're different. Uh, there are outer body experiences and uh, spiritual experiences that other people have that are comparable. You cannot have a near-death experience and still experience God directly. God's trying to reach every single human being. God loves every single human being. You are beloved. And prayer really works. And by that, I mean, you don't get what you want. It's God isn't Santa Claus, but <laughs> prayer, right? But prayer opens the inner door and keeps the door open. And practice of prayer is an access point. Love matters. That's, that's the easiest thing of all. Love matters. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been really great, Sandra. Yeah, I'm just sitting here in peace and wonderment and just i've got a big smile on my face ah oh, anyways and for our listener too thank you for taking the time to listen today i love it love it love it um reminder we don't die radio.com this was episode 127 and i have links to more about our fabulous peter his website his books um his uh just his everything that i can find and i want to just remind you if this episode has made a difference for you have the courage to press share however you listen to this because you never know i mean we we do believe very often that people think we're crazy if we're talking about these things or listening to a show like this but you never know who's near you that's got these questions and they're afraid to ask so it's as simple as hey you know i read this great book and you know i don't know if you believe in this stuff but i, I think it's pretty incredible so i just ask to share so in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I know I'm leaving this episode with um, 
allow yourself to be loved and to love another all is well prayer really works it opens the inner door these things and more from our fabulous guest uh, peter panagor really wonderful so i want to thank you all for listening and we'll see you soon Thank you.